Hey there, everybody. Good to be with you today. My name is Tim, one of the pastors here, and uh, it is so good to be able to gather gather together halfway through the summer here. This uh, is just flying by, and uh, but it's great to be with you. Uh, I have a few announcements I want to draw to your attention today before, as we get going. First is we've got another uh, family worship night coming up on August 17th at 7 p.m. here at the church. And you're going to want to come bring a lawn chair. I forgot my lawn chair last time, but bring a lawn chair. And uh, I'm going to quote Jonah again. So if you missed Jonah the first time with all the voices, and I've got maybe some things I'm going to add to it, but hopefully you can come and be a part of uh, that family worship night. We'd really love to have you there. Uh, secondly, we have a baptismal service coming up on uh, August 21st. That's a couple weeks, and that'll be at Hanson's Place. Again, if you need directions or anything like that, make sure you uh, find out and ask about that. But if you haven't been baptized, we would love for you to get baptized. We want to create these opportunities, these open doors for you to get baptized. And uh, we're going to be having a class on the 14th. Uh, right after the morning service here at the church at 1230. I think there'll be some pizza involved and uh, we'd love for you to come. So if you haven't been baptized, you're thinking about it, you have some questions about what it means to be baptized, uh, then please come on out. If you'd like to be baptized, if, if this is something you're interested in, on the website, on the there's a tab that says I'm new slash connect and there's a connect card and you can just fill that out and say, I'm interested in being baptized. And we'll get back to you and we'll, we'll get things sorted out so we know uh, kind of who's going to be coming on the 14th for the class and who's going to be baptized on the 21st. So I'm really excited about that. Um, there's lots of other announcements. You can find them online. You can find them, uh, uh, you know, by calling to the church, whatever you need to find out what's going on. Check out our website, though. We've got lots of information on there. Uh, we're going to turn our hearts now to uh, uh, spend some time in singing and worship together. Before we do that, I just want to read to you from Psalm 66. It's just so beautiful. It says this, Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. I come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. I will sacrifice to you. Come and hear all you who fear the Lord. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. This is the promise we have. God has not withheld his love from you. So come with open heart, with open uh, uh, a love toward our God who loves us in return. Let's hear from him. Let's let him move in our hearts. Let me pray. Lord, thank you that we can be together here today. Thank you for your deep love for us. And we want to learn to love you more. We want to learn what pleases you, how we can live for you, how we can be in line with you. And so God, I thank you that you are here with us to meet with us wherever we are, driving in the car, sitting in our living rooms, wherever we are, going for a walk. Lord, you are with us and you want to communicate your fantastic, unending love. Help us to have ears to hear that love today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me sing for the breath that you've given Every day for the life you sustain The beat of the heart performed when I was made Worship your wonder and splendor Through the heavens your glory proclaim We don't know the price You pay for the life The sacrifice you made
choice to throw heaven at lost But then Jesus rose with a freely hand That's when death was arrested in my life began Oh, oh, oh In just a moment, we're going to come to God's Word together. And, uh, but before we do that, I want us to spend time in prayer. I love doing this. I love being able to come to God for the needs and the cares that we have. You need to know that God loves you so very much that He is present, that He hears us. And so He says, cast all your cares upon me. So that's what we want to do today. So as I pray, pray with me. Cast your cares upon the Lord. As I pray for those in need, agree with me. Pray along with me. And let's pray for our church. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we can come to you, that you're a God who hears, who understands. You say to boldly approach your throne of grace with confidence that we might receive grace, find mercy to help us in our time of need. And God, we, uh, uh, we are needy people. Um, you know, we uh, live in a world where there's trouble. And you did not deny that we would do that. You said in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. You promised there'd be enough grace for every situation. Some of us need grace for a broken relationship. We need your grace. Have mercy, oh God. Some of us need grace for uh, an addiction or a temptation that we keep falling into. Oh God, please give us your grace. Have mercy on us, oh God. Some of us need grace uh, because of, of health issues. Uh, our bodies are breaking apart or falling apart. There's cancer. There's uh, some other disease. There's some other brokenness. And we need your grace. Have mercy on us, oh God. Some of us need grace because we've, we're broken in our minds. We've, we've heard messages our whole lives telling us things that are not true. Bad things have happened in our past. And, uh, and we carry those wounds with us today. And, and we, we, we do... Um, uh, destructive behaviors and, and negative things because of those wounds that we have in our minds and we need you to touch our minds. So please give us grace. Have mercy on us, oh God. Lord, we need your forgiveness. We need your forgiveness for the things we have done, the sins we have done, and the good that we have not done. Have mercy on us, oh God. We thank you that you are a God of forgiveness and grace. We thank you that we can come to you for everything. Lord, we think of those uh, who are neighbors, who don't know you, who don't know the grace and the love that you offer, and we pray for mercy on them. You'd be patient. You would continue to draw them. You'd use us to communicate your fantastic love to them. We think of those around the world who are struggling and suffering, uh, in war, in famine, uh, flood. Lord Jesus, we pray that you'd have mercy. You'd be close to them. We pray that those who know you as their Lord and Savior uh, would declare 
your goodness, that you would convince them of your love. Thank you that this world is not all there is. Thank you that there is an eternity that waits for us. So while we're here, while we struggle, uh, while we plead for you for mercy, Lord, give us grace to handle each situation. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, half a dozen red roses, six red roses. I want you to imagine for a moment, who would give six red roses? And who would they give them to? And what might be the occasion? When you think of this, what do you think? Probably has something to do with love. Maybe someone, a, a young couple on their sixth month anniversary, or maybe someone, a, a couple married, they've been married, they have a few kids, it's their sixth year anniversary, and so he brings home six red roses. Maybe it's like Jennifer and I, and I gave it when we had six children. Probably not, she would like some, you know, maybe more of a break at a spa than roses. But, uh, you know, somehow we look at this and we think of love. We think of, this is what red roses talk about. Uh, FTD florists, they actually have a, uh, uh, an explanation for different amounts of roses. So one rose means something, two roses means something, six roses means something. And what six roses means is, uh, I want to be yours. So if you give someone six red roses, you're saying to them, I want to be yours. Then I think, boy, this would be great to have this like... Uh, for every worship service, every time we get together to worship God, we should have six red roses. We say to God, hey God, I want to be yours. I think this is something that would make God smile. This would, this would uh, 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 please him because God is always looking for love. God is always looking for love. He's not primarily interested in you having all the right words today, not looking the right part, not having your life all put together. That's not what he's mostly interested in. He's mostly interested in your heart because he's always looking for love. And this is the message of the book of Malachi. So we're at the end of our series called Minor Tweets, and we've looked at uh, uh, Jonah, we've looked at Habakkuk, we've looked at Hosea, and now we're looking at Malachi. Malachi is also the last book of the Old Testament. It's the last uh, and, and it's last on purpose because it's, it's the last thing God said to his people for 400 years, okay? So for 400 years, God was silent after he'd been talking and ministering and caring for his people and, and communicating with them. Uh, for 400 years, he's silent. So you think, wh what happened? If God is always looking for love, uh, why did he become so quiet? Why, did he, why was there so much silence? Well, um, here's what we know about roses. If they're not backed up by love from a person, then they really, they don't really mean anything. Roses matter because they, uh, six red roses as a gift would matter because they're backed up by love. They're sort of backstopped with love. And, and God was experiencing much hurt from his people. I'm not going to lie, this is a difficult this is a difficult book to read. God had been uh, rejected. He'd been uh, falsely accused. He'd been hurt by people. And, and yet he keeps reaching out to them. And the reason he does is because God is always looking to, for love. So again, this is not going to be an easy book to read, but we want to do it because I think it has much to say to us about what, how God wants us to live. Let me give you a quick background of the book. I'm, I got my trusty map up here that I showed you a couple weeks ago. And uh, uh, it's changed a little bit. As you can see, you know, Babylon is kind of the, uh, is the main force. It's the new power on the, on the, on the, in reality. So we talked with Habakkuk. Habakkuk, uh, God had said Babylon's coming. Well, now Babylon has come. So about 586 BC, uh, Babylon had come in. The Babylonians had come in and they captured Judah. Remember Israel, the northern kingdom, Israel had already been uh, decimated by the Assyrians. 
And now Babylon's come in, the Babylonians come to take Judah. And they take them away about 586 BC. Uh, and they take them into captivity. Uh, and one of the ways they do it was just to get them right out of there and indoctrinate them into their, into their way of thinking. So think of Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel was from Judah. And Daniel ended up in the lion's den, which was in Babylon. So he was taken a long way away from home. And uh, then there was, uh, they were there for 70 years or so, and then people started to trickle back to Judah. Uh, the king of Babylon began to let them go back, and they started to come uh, back and to uh, repopulate Judah. And there was a lot of hope, a lot of optimism when they came back. They're thinking, great, the suffering is over. God's going to restore our fortunes. Uh, he's going to promise to bring a king who's going to um, help us even better than when David was king. This is going to be so great. But they found out that God, it wasn't actually working the way they were hoping to. Uh, they were still under all kinds of oppression. After the Babylonians, it wasn't like the Jews became top dog. The Medes and the Persians came. After the Medes and Persians, uh, Alexander the Great came with, uh, with uh, the Greeks and then the Romans. Like it's, it was a, it's been a long time. And so uh, the Jews were getting very disillusioned, very fed up. They kind of were skeptical of religion of the modern religion, and they were skeptical of God. They were uh, involved in lying and lust and murder and, and uh, just doing their own thing. They were treating God like uh, he didn't deserve. So that's where Malachi shows up now. This is this burnt out, disillusioned, frustrated people. And, uh, and Malachi has a message to them from God. Now, the way the book is structured is it's, uh, there's sort of five statements that God makes, okay? So it's a conversation between God and his people. There's five statements that God makes. Uh, the people, they kind of, they push back on those statements and then God gives uh, justification for why he says what he says. Uh, so there's five of those and we're gonna look at all five of them. And then after that, uh, there's, this, there's this small bright light which we're gonna come to and then the promise of an even brighter light at the end of the book, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. Now, before we jump into it, um, there's a verse in chapter 1, verse 6. If you have your Bibles, turn to Malachi 1, verse 6. Again, it's the last book of the Old Testament. And God says this. He says, where is the honor I deserve? Where's the honor I deserve? He's looking for what, it, what belongs to him, and he's not finding it anywhere. And it's this heartfelt, pained cry of God. Where's the honor I deserve? You know, I had a friend who um, his wife left him. And it was an incredibly painful time. He lost a ton of weight. Uh, he, could, he couldn't really make sense of anything. He could hardly even want it to go on. Uh, it, was, it was miserable to watch and maybe even more, probably even more miserable to live. Um, I remember him wanting to try and talk with his, his, uh, his wife and she just was cold and callous toward him and, and treated him like, like he was a piece of dirt and ugh. It was just so painful. And that's kind of what's happening here uh, in this book. Because, you see, sometimes we forget that God is a personal God. We think of him as, uh, you know, uh, this old white guy sitting on a throne, big beard, white hair. You know, he kind of doesn't really have much to do. He just sits on the throne. That's really all he does is sits. You know, if he got, his, got up from his throne, what would he do? Where would he go? We don't know. And he's kind of got a scowl on his face because we're always screwing things up. So he's just sort of mad at us all the time. But, and he's sort of just one-dimensional, um, uh, irrelevant, doesn't, out of touch with what's going on. We forget that he's a person, that God can be hurt, that the Holy Spirit can be grieved, that Jesus wept. We forget that, but it's true. God is a personal God. And... Uh, and God had been hurt by his people. So we're going to jump into this thing, this, these statements. There's five of them. And here's statement number one. God says to them, I have loved you. I've loved you. And they say in response, well, how have you loved us? Give us one way to love us. Now that's got to be painful. If you say you love someone and, uh, and they uh, just say, you've never done anything to love me. This was super painful to God. And so God says, I'll explain to you how I've loved you. He says, okay, 
way back, 1,500 years before this, God had chosen a man named Abraham. This is about 2000 uh, BC. God chose a man named Abraham because what God wanted to do, see there had sin had been in the world, and God wanted to bring healing and, and salvation to the people. He was going to do that through his son, Jesus Christ, who was going to be born uh, as a human being on, on planet Earth. So obviously, this, this, he, Jesus didn't just appear. He was born, and so he needed a family line. And so 2,000 years before Jesus, God chose a man named Abraham. Nothing special about Abraham. God just chose him. And he said to Abraham, he made a promise to Abraham. He said, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All, every single person on the earth will be blessed through Abraham. Well, how is that going to be possible? Well, we find out that 2,000 years later, Jesus was born to a virgin named Mary from the line of Abraham. So from, this, from Abraham came all these families, and then eventually Jesus came. And Jesus brought blessing to all people. Okay, so this is a promise that God made. Now, Abraham had a son. Uh, his son was named Isaac. Isaac was like a miracle baby because uh, Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born and Sarah was 90, like way, way past any time for people to be having babies. They're having babies. And they, ha oh, they had a baby. They had Isaac. And uh, so Isaac was part of the promise because remember, God made a promise to Abraham, not a contract, a covenant. He made a promise to him. And then Isaac had twins, Jacob and Esau. Okay, so now we've got a problem. Which one does God choose? Does God choose the younger, Jacob, or the older, Esau? Well, let me describe them to you, and then you make the choice, okay? So Esau is kind of this big lug of a guy, just kind of um, um, uh, moved by his earthly passions and desires. He's willing to sell out his family for a, a bowl of stew. Uh, he was pretty vengeful. He swore to get revenge on anybody who crossed him. He was not afraid to kill. That's Esau, okay? Now you've got Jacob. Jacob was a liar and a thief. He was a trickster. He was a coward. He ran when there got trouble. He put, uh, you know, more vulnerable people in, in place so that he wouldn't get hurt. That's, that's Jacob. So you've got a uh, vengeful, angry oaf, or you've got a sly, crooked rat. Which one do you want to pick? Good options, right? God made a promise. So he chose Jacob. He could have chose Esau, but he chose Jacob. And he chose to bless Jacob. He poured his blessing on Jacob. Jacob became very wealthy. His son Joseph became uh, second in command in all of Egypt. God brought this family out of captivity from Egypt 400 years later. He provided for them in the wilderness. He cared for them. They passed through the Red Sea on dry ground. God did so many miracles for them. He provided them the judges who rescued them. He provided them kings like King David and King Solomon who led with, with um, wisdom and godliness. They became a, a powerful force because God cared for and loved his people. David writes a lot about how God was a shepherd and, and loving to them. And so God did all these things to show love. But these people here at, in about 500 or 450 B.C., you know, they, they had um, some bad things going around them. And so they're like, nah, you know what? My life is so miserable right now. I don't think God has done anything to show love to me, even though God had. Now, maybe you're in that kind of a situation. You got some things going wrong, some pain in your life, some struggles in your life. And you think, you know what? God, I don't even have any time for God. I don't even like God. He's never done anything for me. He doesn't show any love to me. When in reality, God is constantly pouring his love on you. Yeah, life is hard. Life is hard for me. Life is hard for you. But that does not mean that God does not love us. And for someone who is constantly looking for love and constantly showing love, a statement like, you've never loved me, uh, that's, that cuts to the heart. Well, statement number two. God says, you show contempt for my name. And they go, how have we showed contempt for your name? Well, then God lists off six things. Look at this beautiful flower. You've shown contempt for my name, and God says, uh, you've done all these things to hurt me. And then he lists off six different things. I'm just going to go through them really quickly because uh, I want us to see uh, our place in that hurt too. He says, you bring injured or diseased animals to the altar. 
Well, what does that mean? You know, there was a time when uh, uh, in order for people to receive forgiveness, for God's people to receive forgiveness, they brought sacrifices. Now, it's not that God needed these sacrifices. I mean, he, he, Scripture says he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. God doesn't need these things. But he wanted the people to be aware of their sin, how devastating their sin was. And so because their sin was so bad, God said, I want you to bring me the best, uh, the best of your flocks, the best of your herds, and I want you to sacrifice them. I want you to lose them for me. And what people were starting to say was, ah, you know what? I don't want to really bring the best of my stuff because that's, I like the best of my stuff. I want to bring God the second best or the third best or whatever's left over. That's what I'm going to do. And so that's what they would do. They would bring the, the wounded and lame. And God says, try giving that to your governor. See how he would handle that. See if he would be pleased with you. And yet you bring this stuff to me and you hurt me when you do this. So I think, well, we don't, we don't bring animals or stuff to God, but... But do we bring him our best? Do we bring him our best or do we bring kind of whatever's left over? We spend our passions and our energy and our money and our time and our effort on all other things, our attention on all other kinds of things. And then when we kind of say, oh yeah, God, I guess I should give him something too. We kind of give him whatever's left over. Maybe something we wouldn't really even miss. Well, that's hurtful to God. A second way that they show uh, contempt for God is um, it says you, you sniff contemptuously at, um, at worship, at the things of God, saying that it's not quite up to snuff. So they'd come along, they go, ah, you know what? I don't really uh, dig this worship stuff they got going in the temple. It's kind of dull, it bores me, it's not really revving me up. And so then they just uh, went off and did their other things. Now I see, man, that can be like us too, right? You go to a worship time and you, and you go, I don't know, the band didn't really cut it today or the preacher was kind of off. I didn't really get anything out of it today. This is kind of boring. Uh, I, I want to do something that's more fun, that's more exciting for me. You sniff contemptuously at, God's, uh, at, God, at the things of God. Maybe you, you, uh, you, know, you don't read your Bible very much because you're not really getting anything out of it. You sniff contemptuously at it. You know, we'll be all passionate about our games on our phone, but uh, not so passionate about the things of God. That is a way of showing contempt for God. A third thing he says is that you call worship a burden. He was, these people were calling worship a burden. They weren't going to go to the temple. They had other things to do. They had parties to attend to. They had, they had events to be a part of. They had, they had uh, uh, things that were, you know, were occupying their time. And worship was a burden, man. And, uh, and so they weren't being a part of that. They were just ignoring it. They were doing their own thing. And I, I see that in our lives too. That we can say, you know, uh, if I've got nothing else better to do, I will be a part of worship. But really, it's, it's a bit of a pain. Wake up Sunday morning or whatever, we're like, I don't know. Do you want to do this today? Is there, something, is there more fun to be had somewhere else? Is worship a burden to you? You know, is, uh, is reading your Bible a burden to you? Is praying a burden? That's what these people were saying to God. The fourth thing is they were not treating God as the great king that he is. See, God is a God of mercy and grace and kindness. And because of that, we can get thinking that, uh, ah, you know, he's, he's no different than you or me. He's no different than the guy on the bus. He's no different than, than uh, the people on the beach. Well, he is different. God is high and exalted. Ephesians says this, He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. This is who our God is. He deserves our respect and our reverence and our awe. And when we treat him as something less than that, we show contempt with, to him. A fifth way that they show contempt is by, it says, the priest not preserving knowledge or giving sound instruction. So the priests here, they were, uh, <clears throat> you know, they were trying to make people happy. They wanted people to like them. And so they weren't, uh, they weren't keeping up with telling people what was true about God. And they weren't um, uh, being faithful to what, what God had commanded them to say. Now, you know, this one's on me, right? As, as your pastor, as the one who brings God's word to you each week or leads that team uh, and, and the other teachers in our church, this is kind of on me, I it matters what I, what I say to you. And sometimes I'm super tempted just to say nice things. So you'll like me. And, I, and you know, so you'll say, oh, Tim, we like him so much. He always makes me feel good. 
I'm not called here to make you feel good. I'm, I'm called to tell you about the love of Jesus Christ, the holiness of God. And so that's why I need your prayers for me and for the rest of those who teach at our church, that we would be faithful and true to God's word. We would say what God wants us to say, whether that makes us popular or not. And a sixth thing, and this one's really interesting, a sixth way that they show uh, contempt to God is by getting divorced. He says, you get divorced. You're not going to hear from me because you have not treated your spouse well. Now, this is super interesting. Um, God wasn't listening to the prayers of the people because they were getting divorced. They were treating marriage as a disposable commodity. Now, why is that so important to God? Well, remember, God is always looking for love. And because of that, when we treat this paramount relationship of a man and a woman in a, in a marriage relationship, when we treat that with, uh, with no respect and kind of toss it away and, and treat divorce as, as, a, as a first option, um, it's just going to hurt the heart of God. We're not going to be able to communicate with them. And so maybe, maybe, if you haven't been hearing from God these days, one of the questions to ask is how I've been treating my spouse. Have I been loving them? Have I been serving them? Have I been sacrificing for them? Am I being faithful to them with my eyes, my words, and my body? This is an important question. All right. So those are the ways that, uh, in our second statement, these are the ways that people were showing contempt for God. Now it brings us to our third statement. God says to him, you have wearied the Lord with your words. And they said, how have we wearied you? And you said, by, doing, by saying that all who do evil are good. Now God doesn't really care. God is fine with whatever. You can do whatever you want and God is happy. So they're saying basically marry who you want to marry, be as sexual as you want, be as greedy as you want, worship God any way you want. I mean, he's just lucky to have us. So you do it any way you want. Your truth is truth enough. And God is cool with whatever you do. Because just the very fact that you made a decision, man, your truth, that's, he's really happy with that. Because he just wants you to be happy. So fight for your rights. Hold grudges. Don't forgive. No problem. God is still going to bless you. He's just a good old boy. He's just a good old boy who's ready to bend in any way we want in order to make us happy. That sounds like God, right? Well, that's not the way God is. He won't just bend to make us happy. Why? Is it because he's a killjoy? No, of course not. God is always looking for love. How can someone who is so desperate and looking for love and showing love want to just destroy our lives? He's all about love. So think of a mom and her son going to a playground. Okay? So she loves her boy so much, she takes him to the best playground she can find. She goes, have at her boy, just enjoy your time. So away he goes. And she goes, I just want you to have a good time. Well, actually, he can't do anything he wants, right? He can't leave the playground. He can't run out onto the road, for example. He can't push kids out of the way. He can't throw sticks or call people names. Well, now it's starting to sound like there's a whole bunch more can'ts than there are cans. And is his mother super uh, repressive for him? No, she wants him to enjoy himself to have the best experience of the playground that he can. And because of that, there are a bunch of things he cannot do because she loves him so much. And that's how it is with our Heavenly Father. He loves us so much, so he says there are things you cannot do. And people say, if you say I can't do something, that means you don't love me. Doesn't that sound like our society? Doesn't it sound like we, we want God just to be happy with whatever choice we make? It almost sounds like Malachi was written this year, even though it was written 2,500 years ago. So that's the, the third statement. Our fourth statement is this. God says, will a mere man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. And again, his people, being the way they are, they go, how, how have we robbed you? What have we ever done to rob you? God says, by not bringing the whole tithe into the church, by holding back from me, by not giving God what is his, by not trusting, by not remembering all the ways that God has blessed us. Man, now God is getting personal, right? Now he's talking about money. He's stepping on our toes. Did we read this correctly? When we don't give, and he's talking about money here, when we don't give, we're robbing God? Whoa. I mean, isn't it supposed to be that we can give or not give? It's just our choice and God is happy with whatever we do? Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Well, apparently not. 
He uses some pretty strong language here. He says, you are robbing me when you don't give. Well, how did he come to that? Where do we come to this robbing sense? The thing we need to understand is that everything we have comes from God. It's all his. We are what are called stewards, not owners, stewards. But we forget this. We think that we're owners. And we think that everything we have, everything we've worked for is ours. This is a huge mistake, everybody. It is because what we have comes from God. He is the one who has blessed us. You know, our ACC missions board, we're sending some money over to um, uh, uh, some uh, drought ra uh, ravaged areas in Africa. We want to keep people alive. So some of the money that has been given to the church, we're giving that away to try and keep people alive. Now, those people that are in this drought area and are starving and are dying, are they doing that because they're so much less worthy than me? Am I so much more worthy of a human that I get to live in Canada with all that I have, with the opportunities that I have, with the, uh, the comforts and the ease that I have, with the wealth that this country gives us? No, of course not. I'm not more worthy. I'm just fortunate. And so are you, that God has blessed us with what he's blessed us with. But it's all his. And so he says, um, I want you to give back a tithe. Okay, that's what he talks about here. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, he says in Malachi. Well, what, is, uh, what does that mean? What does a tithe mean? Well, a tithe means one-tenth. And so uh, one-tenth of what we have. It's been Jennifer and my practice, our whole married life, and even, even my own practice since I was like a little kid, to give 10% of my gross income back to the Lord, at least that much back to the Lord. And this has been awesome for me. This has been... Uh, uh, a real a blessing in my own life because it keeps me from depending too much on money. And money is super unstable. We know this. Uh, you know, the market could crash. We could lose everything tomorrow. And um, so if we put our trust in money, we will be disappointed all the time. It, it refoc when I give, when I tithe, it refocuses my life and my work toward Jesus. It helps me to have a generosity mindset that I'm always thinking about how I can be generous, how we can share. If, because it reminds me that I'm just a steward. This is all God's stuff anyways. So how can I share? I get to store up treasure in heaven. And I get to open the door for God to pour blessing in my life. This is what he says in Malachi to his people. He says, just, just test me in this. Trust me in this. You give the tithe. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, into the church. And you see what I will do. I will pour blessing on your life. Now, does this mean that if we give $1,000, that he'll give us $5,000 next week? No, uh, he may, but likely not. Uh, but it does mean that he will pour blessing. He will pour blessing in, in, in uh, clothes that don't wear out, in a car that just keeps running, in uh, people lending to us or, or you know, blessing us and in, in, in back again. Um, he'll, he'll bless us with peace and with joy, with his forgiveness, with his presence. Mostly it's about... Um, leaning more on Christ and experiencing more of Christ. He says, when we give, he will pour blessing on us. This is what he does for us personally. But he also does things for the church. This is why he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Bring your tithe into the church. Why? Well, because things, when you bring the tithe into the church, here's what happens. Uh, the lights get turned on. The doors get opened. The building gets paid for uh, the camera gear that we're filming on right now, uh, all this stuff, all the, all the technology that we need, it all gets paid for so that we can communicate the gospel to people. And there's all kinds of ministries that take place. I, in fact, asked the pastors on staff here to, to just write up um, uh, all the ways that, they, that God is, is working in their ministries. And so if you want to see kind of what your dollar is going for, then I would encourage you to um, online, uh, just go to, uh, it's called under, um, I can find it, under ministries. If you look under ministries, uh, then there is uh, 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 the first button there, I forget what it's called, future something. And uh, just click on that, and, in, and there's a brochure, you can just read up about all the great things that God is doing here at ACC. And that's because we're giving. We're not government funded. The government doesn't come to us. We're not funded by some kind of lottery. You know, it's not like one or two patrons of the church are paying for all this. All this happens because you and I give. 
That's the only way this happens. And so thank you for your giving. And I encourage you to keep doing that. You know what? If everybody just tithed, if everybody lived off 90% of what God had given them and tithed 10%, money would be no problem in the church. We would be able to help so many people. We'd be able to do so many great things because we would have an excess, uh, uh, an abundance, and the dreams that God could birth in us if people would tithe, if we would all tithe. So that's my encouragement today. Fifth and last statement. You still tracking with me? God says this, you have spoken arrogantly against me. And they say, how? How have we done that? When have we ever spoken arrogantly against you? He says, you've spoken arrogantly against me when you say, it is futile to serve God. It is futile to serve the Lord. That the wicked people seem to get away with everything and good people just suffer. You know, this is what it looked like for them. Babylon was living high in the hog. Uh, evil people were getting away with stuff. People that were trying to do good, they just were having a hard life. And it is true, you know, that, that we can see this happen. Um, bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. It does seem to make sense. And sometimes we can be like those guys, and we can agree with them. We can sing like Billy Joel sang in, uh, in his song, in his um, Only the Good Die Young. He writes, and they say there's a heaven for those who will wait. Some say it's better, well, I say it ain't. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints because the sinners have a lot more fun. Only the good die young. You know what? Sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's true. Maybe Billy Joel was right. I mean, he's sitting on a quarter million dollars. That guy's probably doing great. No, sorry, a quarter of a, what's it? $250 million, quarter of a billion dollars. So yeah, he seems to be doing well. Maybe he's right. But he's not right forever. And God has a plan, a bigger plan. And those Jews at that time and us today, we can be thinking on a, on a small scale, on a short-term deal, and not looking at that God is a God of eternity. So those are the five points of contention that God had with, with his people. Not that pretty of a bouquet anymore, is it? They wouldn't recognize his love for them. They were offering defiled sacrifice. They wearied him with his words, with their words. They robbed him. They spoke arrogantly against him. Now, you'd think he'd be completely done with those people. I mean, if someone gave you this bouquet of flowers, and they said, this is, this is an expression of my love, snip, 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 uh, you'd, you'd kind of be a little bit wary of that kind of a relationship. If it was a friend of yours, and they were in a relationship like that, you'd say, man, that, that thing's toxic. You need to get out of that relationship. That person is abusive, is a gaslighter, is a narcissist. You should get out of that. Be as far away as you can. And that's what God should do. That's what we should counsel God, to be done with those people. But God is always looking for love. So he looks and he searches those people to try and find them. And then he finds this beautiful, beautiful small group. A remnant. It says in 3.16, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honor his name. Despite it all, despite whatever was going around them, their captivity, or their, uh, you know, their, having, their dreams hadn't quite come true with what they thought God was going to do in their lives, despite the Babylonians still being in power, and then the Medes and the Persians coming along, despite all of that, they were looking for love as well. They were looking for love from the God who was looking for love. And they met each other. And they wanted to give themselves fully and wholly to them. And God saw that and wanted to bless them. And that's why we come to this, this, um, this key word, this key theological term called remnant. A remnant is a, like a, a remainder of something. So this, this rose is a remnant of that bouquet of roses. It's, one, it's way less than what we started with, but it's still a remnant of those roses. And so Isaiah promised this, other prophets promised this, that there would be a remnant that would come. And um, when the people left Babylon and started to repopulate Judah, uh, it was a lot less than those who went to, to Babylon. A lot less. There's only a remnant, a small, a physical remnant was left. And out of that physical remnant, there was even a smaller group, this little group that huddled together. They were the spiritual remnant. And God promised that there will always be a remnant. And it reminds me of what Jesus said, broad is the road and wide is the gate that lead to destruction. 
and many find it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Only the remnant finds it. And so God sees this remnant of people and his heart wells up with love and joy and, and delight in them. And he, he reaffirms the promise that he made to Abraham way, way back. Here's what he says in chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. This is kind of the central message of the book. He says, On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them, just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who who do not. And then Malachi 4 ends with this promise of a day coming, a day when people's hearts would be turned back to love. It's a, it's a looking forward to Jesus, that Jesus is going to come. And I'm going to share with you a verse. It's a New Testament verse. It's happened, came up 400 years after uh, Malachi, somewhere in there. And it says this. You may have heard it before. It's John 3, 16. It says, For God so loved the world. Now, think about this world for just a second here. 400 years earlier, this toxic relationship. And these are the people that are supposed to be God's people. These are the people that are supposed to love him. And it was toxic. It was abusive. It was um, uh, calloused and cold. For God so loved the world. And what about the people around them, the people that weren't God's people, the people that were serving pagan gods and, and falling after their own lusts and pleasures and desires and living in evil? Were they better than God's people? No, they were just as bad. For God so loved the world. And then look at you and me. Look at our lives, our propensity to, to sin, to walk away from God, to do evil deeds, to be in the darkness. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God is always looking for love. He wants to show love to everybody. It says this in Romans, the, um, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why would he keep going the extra mile to show his love? Why would he not just give up on us? Why wouldn't he quit? Because God is always looking for love. Always. It's who he is. God is love. And so he pursues you. He pursues me. Because he loves us so much. Will we respond to his gracious and generous love? I'll tell you about another flower. It's called the catapult flower. It's a Sri Lankan flower. It blooms just before midnight and then dies just before dawn. It's the shortest lifespan of any flower in the world. Blooms just before midnight, dies just before dawn. Uh, it's never been given as a gift because it's just dead too soon to give it away. And. Uh, it's just, uh, it's here for a moment and then gone. Compare that to uh, the Sempervivum plant called Hens and Chicks. This is a plant that also has the name the forever plant. It, uh, it can handle floods, it can handle drought, it can handle sun, it can handle shade. It can handle it all. It just goes, lives and lives and lives. And I wonder, what's my love like for God? Am I like the um, a catapult flower, just a flash in the pan? Just here for a moment, something else gets my attention and it's gone. Or am I like the hens and chicks that I, I want to last and endure? I want to be, have a love for God like he has for me. Friends, this is what God is calling us to. Maybe you've, uh, you've wandered. You've been like those, those Jews back there in the book of um, Malachi. And God is calling you to recommit your heart to him today. To surrender anew to him today. Say, Jesus, I've wandered away but I'm coming back to you. And God is ready and welcome to receive you because he is always looking for love. Well, we're going to come to the communion table now <clears throat> with all this book of Malachi in mind. You know, we're sinners. 
We wander away from God. We turn to other things that entertain us and satisfy us. <clears throat> but this God, who is always looking for love, <clears throat> is drawing us back to him over and over again. <clears throat> he reminds us that he gave himself for us <clears throat> so that we could be forgiven, so we could enjoy an intimate relationship with him. And so I want us to take time <clears throat> to be quiet before the Lord, to <clears throat> examine our hearts. <clears throat> Scripture tells us to examine our hearts. That's what Malachi is. It's a book of examination. That we would look at what God, <clears throat> at where we are to God and our relationship with him. Are we loving him or are we loving ourselves? So we don't come to this communion table quickly. We don't come to it uh, 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 recklessly. We come to it carefully. We come to it realizing that we are sinners and that our only hope for salvation comes through Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us. He looked at all of our, of our wickedness and the choices that we made, and then he died for us, put his life on the line that we might be forgiven and have eternal life. And so as we come, as we do in every one of our services, we have a time at the end where we listen to Jesus. I want to take that quiet time now and just for you to prepare your hearts. Prepare your heart for what, um, for, to remember what Christ has done for us on the cross. Let's pray together. Maybe God has been pointing out something in your life where you are living like those guys back then showing contempt or robbing God or <clears throat> angering him with your being arrogant. You know, when God rebukes, he does it because he loves us. He only rebukes those he loves. So if you feel that rebuke today from him, receive it as an act of love, as a gift of love from him. Maybe as you, you know, think about communion and think about what we said in this passage, there's something you want to confess to God and uh, make right with him. And do that now. And listen to his words of grace and acceptance to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Well, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took a cup. He said, this cup... <clears throat> This cup that they'd all been drinking from. <clears throat> it wasn't like he had a special one. It was just one of the cups that was there. But he said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. And I see your wickedness. And I've poured out my life on you to forgive your sins. So he said, when you drink this cup, you remember me. You remember the sacrifice that I made. Let's drink together. Jesus also took some bread. <clears throat> not, a, not a fancy dish. Something that was accessible to everyone. A loaf of bread. He broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Uh, you broke the law. And you, and you brought death on yourself. I break my body and bring life to you. 
That's what Jesus said. So as we take this, we, we remember Christ's sacrifice for us. Let's eat together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your incredible sacrifice. We know we've hurt you in the past, and we'll hurt you again. We'd be hopeless without your complete forgiveness. And so, Lord, we don't want to run and hide. We want to step into the light and have you point out where we, f we fall short because we want those things to be gone. We want to confess them and to be forgiven by you and to live in right relationship with you. This is only possible through your sacrifice on the cross. And it's only possible through our confession and our agreement with you, agreeing with you that what you did was, was right and true and we needed it. So we are grateful, Lord. We're grateful for all that you've done. We receive your forgiveness and grace in your life. We will do this until you come back in. We proclaim that you are coming back and you'll make all things right. You'll wipe away every tear from our eye. You will deal with every wrong that's ever been done. And you will give eternal life to those who believe in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
thanks again, everybody, for being with us uh, today. And I trust that you have sensed the mercy and the love of God, how, how desperately He loves you and cares about you. The scripture says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal, hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. God's love for you does not end. He is always looking for love. So go this week in peace, knowing that you are deeply loved by God. Respond to his love uh, with, with uh, uh, abandon and joy and freedom and passion. Because it's when we love God in return, when we receive his love and give him love in return, that we live the best lives we can live. God bless you guys. Proud of you. See you next week.